Hello everyone, good morning. Shagun Fatumo, how are you today? <coughs> Tokumbo, hello, good morning. Baby, doom. <laughs> what, what is that picture? Interesting. Nkem, hi. Boss, Famo, happy. Paul Eric, Joti Dowu, Tina Steven, Marshall Esong. Ojekwa Israel, hi. Emily Edoko, uh, Rochelle White, Tiger Diebre. <laughs> Rochelle White say, Good morning, Pastor Sunday. You are one of the best investments of my life. <laughs> From the other side of the world, from New Zealand. Uh, you are in New Zealand, and I'm here, and I'm your best, in, the best investment of your life. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I'm happy, I'm happy. That makes me happy. That makes me happy. Thank you. Nana Kalu say, Pastor, you are looking good. Are you sure? <laughs> oh, no, I look ordinary. <laughs> I think I just look ordinary. I just I try to come here. I just look as simple as I could. Abayo me, Apostle Abayo me on Adikwe. Gabgo Vera. Guevara. Oh, Guevara. Ah, oh, it's not Guevara. It's Givara. Okay. Givara, Givara, Givara. Okay, Gi. Right, I got it now. Give her a... Hello, Elizabeth. How is Kenya? Ovi Dominic Okoli Emeka. Hello, Lindu Eric. Fumi Adewusi. Ladi Shorunke. Bola Luro. Jacob Sali is here. Lola Shorunke. Abhishek Jason from India. Nalona Debayo, Ireland. Mayowa didn't uh, I don't know where it's from. Aline Paradise, Shioma Ugudi, Kazim Ahmed, Winifred Alpan, uh, Nosa Favor, Esther Kuganja, uh, Rafi Akala, Bereket Tekle, Fumi Jeboda, Shao Smith. Fabo Happy, David Otori, uh, Jake Hockey, uh, David Otori is asking me to post my email address. I can, I, you, you write it. I said it that you write. I don't post. You write. It is pastor at godembassy.org. Pastor at godembassy.org. If you cannot write that, then I wonder what you can do. So you write that. That's simple enough to write. I know Joe, good morning. Akinla B. Abo Oba. Oba Sonjo. Wow. Good morning. Is that one of, is that Oba Sonjo for president? Our former president? Maybe not. Olukayo de Kundayo. Good morning. Well, yeah, we are, we are ready to go. So nice to uh, see all of you here this morning. And um, I hope you today you got notification. Yesterday, people didn't get notification. I hope some of you got notification today. Ike Amadi is back. Wow. Okay. Well, here we go, and uh, it will be nice to have you go and share the link. Just let's quickly go and share the link before we continue. Uh, look for your share button. <laughs> let's go share the link, please. Let's go share the link. Once we share the link, we'll be ready to go. So look for your share button. Look for your share button. And we'll be ready to go. All right. Have you all shared the link? 
as everybody shared. Once you've shared it, then we can take off from there. You see, this week we're still continuing to talk about calling. We are still continuing to talk about calling, how to help you discover your calling, how to help you discover who you are. Why you are here on the earth, what God sent you here for. And the topic for today is your calling is in what you can do without noticing time. That looks simple, isn't it? Your calling is in what you can do without not noticing time. Are there some things that you can do without noticing time? I'm not like saying, this is not talking about, you know what people do, especially when we were <laughs> young, and uh, we used to say, oh, I work and I'm looking for out of one away time. Let's just go and play somewhere. Let's one away some time. Let's one away time. This, <laughs> this point I'm making today is not about winding away time. <laughs> Anybody can do stupid stuff. Anybody can be foolish. <laughs> Anybody can spend time foolishly and just, you know, unthoughtfully. Anybody can be unthoughtful. Anybody can be stupid. Anybody can be foolish. Anybody can just spend their time and wind it away and kill the time. That's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about being the, the ability to be so engulfed in watch in serious matters without even minding the time so your calling is in whatever you are able to go into devote your time into imagine yourself into so much so deep that you don't even care for the time you don't care for how long you are there how many hours has passed and how you know how long your time there, you know, when you just imagine yourself into something serious that you are so caught up with it that it takes all your time that maybe you only have time to eat and to 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 go to the restroom. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't, you know, you are just so busy. And and that is not, you know, some. I don't. Let me start by telling you some of the wonderful stories that I like in this way. And I never thought that this would ever happen to me, but you know what? You know, I'm moving more and more to that lifestyle myself. Uh, I don't. There is a story that is told of Thomas Edison, but not just Thomas Edison. But let me start with the story of George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver is one of the greatest inventors in the world that has ever lived. In fact, he's my own greatest inventor. Um, Thanks to George Washington Carver, I got to know the secrets of invention. And that's why I'm so convinced that I can invent. And invent inventing and uh, it's not a big deal. George Washington Carver is a black man, a son of a slave, who was actually a slave himself, a former slave, and who sent himself to school. Uh, got himself educated in a very dramatic situation in America. But that slave boy was eventually to be the one to rescue the economy of the southern part of the south in America, southern part of America. So instead of him going to gather all the, C, all the GOs of America to do conference and prayer meetings in the stadium, <laughs> when the economy of America hit, a bottom law because they they you know there was a law that cancelled slavery and when they let all the slaves go uh they account, there was nobody to work on the fields and only a few people so there was nothing to do the economy just collapsed and then also the con the uh what they call it cotton business just dropped because the, the slaves were producing the cotton so and the cotton was the you know with the source of the economy was the backbone of the economy of the south just like nigeria now when this backbone of the economy is um, is uh, is oil and so now when it's just like the same similar situation when the economy is going down because uh, they couldn't produce cotton anymore there was no demand for cotton and and of course there was also mechanization uh there was you know industrialization was coming so people would, they didn't need to you know so a lot of changes were happening in the economy 
just like with our country Nigeria when the oil is no more selling I mean they cannot produce enough the uh, militants are you know bumping everything and there is no income there is no revenue one single man saved the economy of America one single man one single man and that single man was a black man <laughs> I mean can you imagine right now with the situation America, Nigeria is going through that one person will come and bring about an invention that will bring the same amount of money that we are making in oil or even more money that we, that, that, than, than with oil. Can you imagine somebody doing that? And the invention they came up with was granite. Granite. He used granite to produce more money than cotton, than like we say oil can produce. One man. He was led by the Spirit. He was so close to God, friendly with the Holy Spirit. And he was a ferocious inventor, thinker. You know, he was innovator. He was a great man. Go and read the story of George, George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver. You know, he was, he was something else. So he was, pro he was producing from granite alone, I think close to 400 different products. 400 different products from granite. It's unbelievable. 400 different products. And he just used that to revolutionize the economy of the South. And that's how America economy survived the Depression. Because of one man. And we are in Nigeria, we have 170 million people. But instead of us to tell them to go to the library and to go to the labor laboratory, lab laboratories and go and do invention and innovation and go and lock themselves up in the library and laboratories, we tell our people to go lock themselves up in the, in, in the church <laughs> or in the stadium with, 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 with a bunch of other people. You know, but to go to so just be praying and praying and praying. And, you know, it's not bad to pray, but what do you do? What is the result of the prayer? What do you do after the prayer? This man also was a praying man. He was a man of God. He was one of the greatest Christian inventor, inventors you ever heard, hear about. And uh, he was a praying man. He was a believer, a strong believer. And he did everything through his relationship with the Holy Spirit. But, you know, today... We, they just tell us to pray, 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 and wait for God to come and do it. And that was the difference between the praying men of those days and praying men of today. The people who prayed that time, they prayed and went out of, from the place of prayer to go and do it, what they have prayed about, to go and perform it, to go and make the miracle happen. They are not waiting for God to make the miracle happen. Well, that's not what I wanted to tell you about, about George Washington Carver. The story about George Washington Carver is this. The man was such a workaholic. Even though he was a Christian. So this, this is a departure from a lot of what Christians are doing today. I mean, that you just pray, God will make a way, or you don't need to work hard, or one day of favor is better than, you know, 12 days or 10, two years of labor or something. Some funny quotations, some funny, you know, indolent thoughts and sayings that Christians have come up with, that one day of favor is better than 10 years of labor. If you don't labor, you don't get any products. You don't get any reward. You don't get any results. You don't get any products. You need time to produce any products. You need time to produce any service. You need time to do quality. You need time to be able to do anything competitive. You need time to be able to produce anything worthwhile. Anyway, so what I'm, you know, you remember the topic of today is that um, your calling is in whatever you can do uh, whatever you are doing that you could imagine yourself so much in that you don't even remember the time. I mean, whatever, what is, whatever it is that could take your time, so that could take, that could, that you could put yourself in, that you could imagine yourself in, that you could so much, you know, immerse yourself into and dedicate yourself to be doing something constructive and productive to the extent that you don't, you don't notice time. So whatever you can do without noticing time is your calling. Whatever you can do without noticing time is your calling. Whatever you can do without noticing time. So that's why I started to talk to you about you know, George 
Washington Carver. George Washington Carver is one of my big loves. It's one of the loves of my life. I cannot get tired about him. I cannot get tired about him. You know, it's my love story. It's my love story. And anyway, George Washington Carver, one of the things that he did is that he would go, I mean, he, he was so convinced about invention. He was so serious about contributing something to this to his world. He was so busy inventing, studying plants, leaves, plants, and nature that he didn't have time to he didn't have time to marry. He didn't have time to marry. He didn't have time for women. <laughs> he was so caught up with it that he was so busy. So when you are so busy as not to notice beautiful women, then you are very busy. <laughs> then you are really God. <laughs> most men, <laughs> most men are not like George Washington Carver. Most men notice women, <laughs> even if they are scientists uh, or even if they are inventors. They still notice, they still have a little bit of time to notice beautiful women. But not George Washington Carver. <laughs> George Washington Carver was so much in love with science. He was so much in love with plants. He was so much in love with nature. He wanted to get the secret of nature. He wanted to get the secret of plants. He, want, he was so caught up with, uh, with, with invention and with creativity, with innovation, that he was a genuine inventor. He was a genuine scientist. He was such a scientist that he gave his all for it. So whenever you, you know, you don't, you know, when we were in secondary school and we were young, and those boys who never had time for girls, we used to call them crazy. Now I know better. I know better. My, if you know anybody, if you have, if you have any contact with youth, with young people, and maybe your son, or your children, or your siblings, or your uh, family people, or you are a teacher, and you know the way they used to mock, uh, and even parents and adults used to put pressure on those young men, and tell them, you are not living your life, go find something interesting to do, go find a girlfriend, go find friends, go and go do and do this, why are you just reading, 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 reading? Go have fun, go have some fun. And we used to think, and I used to believe it. I used to think that, you know, if you don't have fun, it means you are not normal. That is what the society tells you. God, Jesus. And it is because of those kind of stupid thought life, stupid thoughts, saying that if you don't have fun, you are not living. Those kind of rubbish, mediocre and mediocre life, no, you know, worldview that is killing innovation in us. It is because of those stupid, mediocre, kind of mediocre, kind of, you no know, thoughts that is making us to kill the geniuses among us. It's making us to destroy the passion and the calling, the destiny of thousands of people, of our youth, of our children. Because we discourage them from going into solitude. Solitude with their invention, solitude with their thoughts, solitude with their creativity. We stop them from imagining themselves in something that can really give birth to the deliverance of all nations. We stop them from imagining themselves in creativity so strong that could enrich the world, that could have bettered the world, lifted the world up and changed the world. We, we chase them from their place of concentration, from their place of productivity, from their place of destiny. I mean, I, you know, I don't know where you grew up or what are the culture where you were growing up. But where I grew up, in fact, the reason why I started having girlfriends and partying and doing all the discotheque is because of that mindset, you know. That, I mean, you don't live a boring life. We thought it was a boring life. You don't live that kind of fun life, fun-driven, pleasure-oriented lifestyle. I didn't know that that is the bankrupt, bankruptcy lifestyle, to be looking for pleasure, looking for boyfriend, girlfriend, and, and, uh, and discotheque, and have dance. That is vanity upon vanity lifestyle. Life, lifetime of frivol frivolity, frivolousness. 
frivolous lifestyle. And even the adults, even the teachers will push you into that kind of lifestyle. And tell you, go and have fun. And you, I mean, you are not enjoying life. You are not enjoying life. What are you, I mean, what are you doing in your life? Go and enjoy life. I mean, there are some good guys that just like to be alone. There were some good guys that was that just like to be studying, to to you know to just be you know to be thinking. But in our culture, I mean, I read some one one comment yesterday by I think it's a it's someone who is not African, and uh, I think she used to go to an African church, and she said, "I stopped going to African churches." I said, "What?" Well, I mean, the person is writing in my comments. And, and she said, why? Because, you know, Africans just like, they don't want you to be alone. They don't like you. I like to be alone and to be private and to think and just study and read. But they don't want you to be like that. They always come to bother you and say, oh, you are not happy. Are you depressed? Are you alone? No, are you uh, sad? Is anything wrong? You know, they just want to bother you. They, they don't want you to be alone. They don't want, they don't, our culture does not appreciate privacy. Our culture does not appreciate solitude. Our culture thinks that if you are, if you are alone, if you are private, if you are, you know, be, you know, in solitude, that you are, you know, that, that you are, that you are living a boring life, that you are bored. So they want to help you. They are thinking they are helping you. They put pressure on you. They come and be dragging you through um, and be pull, pushing pressure on you to get out of solitude. To get out of solitude. So, uh, so it's crazy. So I want just, I'm saying this just to be able to help somebody up there that the way we spend our time is a pointer to our destiny. And if you see a young man that is spending his time in something that takes away his time, in something that is so engulfing to him, that is so involving for him, that is making him to do something constructive, maybe to study, don't you ever touch him. Uh -huh. You know, I, I used to, when, you know, let me tell you a little bit about myself. <laughs> you know, I always get emotional talking about myself. It's not a good thing. But sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> you know, I told the story already that I never could read till I was 10 years old. I couldn't even read. 10 years, I was in class 4 or so. Or class 5 before I could begin to read. You see, some of these stereotypes could handicap young men. Some of these stereotypes could maim people. Some of these stereotypes could paralyze your life and destiny. Okay, let me take a book. Let's say this book now. If this is and, and there, somebody will tell me this is and, A-N-D. And I will say, why and? You just taught me that it is A. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Because they taught me alphabet. And I, I caught up the alphabet. I could remember the alphabet. I, I got alphabet. But when you write it, you don't call it A. You call it and. I say, ah. How and? But it's A. Why should you say it? You just told me it is A. Are you not the one who just told me it is A? So when they write Papa, they say Papa. I say, ah, no, I don't understand. <laughs> okay, I will say it if you want me to say it. That it's Papa. P-P-A-P-A. -P -A. You want me to say it's Papa? Okay, I will say it's Papa. But I don't say that this is Papa. They say, they just, so they, instead of explaining it, they just begin to beat me in the head. They just, they, she, she, she beat me in the head and say, you are dull, you are dull, you cannot read. 
Everything I read is questionable. I want to question it. I want to say, but this is not the way it's written. What is written is pay. You say it's A, P, A. You say A, B, C. If it's A, it's pay, pay. But you now telling me it's Papa. So my mind couldn't come around with. That's why I, didn't, I was not good in mathematics. Because I couldn't understand why you just tell me, go and read the formula here and copy it so you do that. I want to think of other ways to do it. Why don't you allow me to think, come up? I want to come up with a way of resolving, not just copy what other people have said or what other people have already discovered. It's always not interesting for me to just use what other people have discovered. I don't know if you people get it. You know, it's not always interesting for me to just follow the rule. Just say, okay, just do this. I feel I'm, I'm being violated, that I'm not a human being. That's the way I always felt from childhood. So when they tell me, they, they, they put anything down, they, wrote, they write anything and they share, okay, let's, let's say leadership. Leadership. <laughs> I said, but this is E A. Leadership. But why do you call leadership? So I always question anything, everything. But my teachers and my family and my relatives that were trying to teach me to get to read. So I got into a stupor because of that. I couldn't get A. Because they would tell me A, B, C is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. They would tell me that is it. This is the way out. It is A. Then when I begin to read, they would tell me, no, it is A now. And this other one, it is E. It's he, he, leadership here. Yeah, it's not I anymore. It's not even A. <laughs> so it got me so messed up in my mind. I, so they would just be beating me. You can't read. You can't read. And in, at my school and in my environment where I was growing up, kids were already reading at six years old. At six, six years old, you are supposed to be reading already. And they just kept on beating me. I couldn't read. They would take me to the next class, class two, I didn't even know how I got there. But still, I would not be able to read. Because of that confusion in my mind, I would always be having questions. And because uh, I was not reading, because I couldn't read because I couldn't think straight, like, they, they, you know, just in the line, straight line thinking. And I didn't know that that was even the problem. Now It's just recently that I discovered that. But they, were only, they had only one explanation. And the explanation was, you are too dull, you are too dull. You, are, you don't want to study, you are too dull. Just keep on beating, 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 beating. You will never study, you don't want to study, you don't know anything, you are dull, what is in your head? All kind of things. At the end of the day, when I was grown up, I just decided that, okay, I will just do what they tell me to do. <laughs> they will kill me. I'm going to kill me. <laughs> I didn't know that what I was having was actually a different way of studying. I never knew that I had critical thinking. I had a critical mind. And my own style of study was through critical thinking. Not seeing things in the ordinary way. Not seeing, just not following the chart. Not following the, the path that everybody follows. And if you see my teaching, if you listen to me, if you are one of the people listening to me, you will discover that Pastor Sunday talks differently. That Pastor Sunday reasons differently. You will discover that I bring out things other people don't see. That is as a result of my critical thinking. And that's the way I learn. That is just my nature. I've got to study. I've got to understand everything for myself. I, you, I don't just repeat what other people are saying. I ju don't just follow what other people are saying. I've got to study it. I've got to agree with it before I repeat it. I've got to know it's right. And I've got to look at it from every angle. I've got to get to the truth by myself. But I was almost killed for that. But it is because they used to just say, 
in that time that you can only study two ways. Either you study by what you hear or by what you see. Visual and, you know, sound. So they, use, they will show me the house. I see the house, but they will say I should pronounce it opposite of what is written in my own mind. But my own way of thinking and learning was through critical thinking. But they couldn't appreciate that. You know, I needed to follow. So that's why I was not good in mathematics as well. And in mathematics, uh, they would just say, you know, there is a formula that was given to you last week. So that formula is what you use for all these things. How can I judge you one formula that is just, okay, this other one is one, this formula, this other one is one. How can I just be using something that is already made, got by somebody, and then use it to apply to... But you, I didn't know that. Yes, that's for some people. That is okay. That is... But that is creativity too. You could take that to do another thing to create, to, dif to discover different formulas and all, all that. So I want, that's what I wanted to. I wanted to discover different formulas. Let me, okay, I got the formula you gave me. But let me use this formula and create my own. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, okay, I got it. You gave me this formula. I'm not against it. Let's use it to resolve this. But the, the, in resolving the other thing, I want to now approach it. Use this formula and get my own formula. But they said, no, you are wrong. And they begin to beat you again. It was later on in life that I discovered that you just follow that formula. That's it. I said, ah, so easy. So why are everybody saying that mathematics is so difficult? I discovered that it's too easy. I thought I needed to come up with it, with the answer. But now I didn't need to come up with any answer. I just need to remember. I didn't know that mathematics is so easy like that. Because I, I used to think, you, you must think it out. You must come up with it, with the answer. That's what I like to do. Anyway, why am I telling this story? When I eventually did what they told me to do, I mean, when I eventually began to read the way they encouraged me to read, when I eventually started... I got it. I, I, I could read. I could, the way I could, I could read eventually, I so much started enjoying it. I started enjoying reading so much that so bad that I couldn't get myself out of the book. I couldn't get the book out of my hand. I started reading. I was so happy. I did it. I was so happy. I was so satisfied. I, I was getting so much knowledge that, oh my God, I wanted to stay in the house the whole day just reading. I would have holidays for three months and I would just like to stay in the house for three months just reading different books. But because I was in the village, my, my grandmother would not allow me to just sit down and be reading. It's like, it's like I'm lazy. <laughs> Like you are lazy. How can you say that I just be ready? You don't want to go and walk in the farm. Let's go. <laughs> no, they take me to the farm. They, they come and kick me out of there. I take me to the farm. <laughs> and they take me to the bush. Take me to the uh, to the forest and to go and fell some trees and you know and shop up trees and things like that and you know do what I needed to do. To, to put food on the on the table and provide for the family. But if they had allowed me, but later on, thank God, God helped me, I still got to a place when I was on my own and I could I could uh, st now study on my own and things like that. But still, can you imagine how many kids are suffering from this thing? How many parents are depriving their Children, I mean, they are, they are kids, so they are children of, you know, and grow and grossing themselves in what they love to do. Because that is actually a pointer to what God has called them to do. Because your calling is in something that you could just spend your whole life doing, your whole time doing, without even noticing time. I used to like it so much that I would, I'm reading, I start reading, I.